the focus at this point in time for any investor in the world should be Bitcoin. The future on average home will be less than 0.1 Bitcoin. The total value of all real estate assets in the world is around $330 trillion. And then Bitcoin is a trillion dollar asset. So a $50 million um, Bitcoin price target is realistic. When you think what could buy you 50 million today? When I understood that, that Bitcoin is superior store of value to real estate and it's the fastest growing asset class in the world, I really started to understand that it most likely will have an impact on real estate. You will not say, oh, my house is worth $1 million. We'll just say my house is worth 0.1 Bitcoin. Change starts with the individual. So in order for housing to become more affordable, the individual has to take action himself or herself and buy Bitcoin to be able to afford more in the future because Bitcoin is disinflationary. The new unit of account that I personally use is Bitcoin and it's repricing every asset in the world. And if you price real estate in Bitcoin, you can see how drastically real estate is falling in price when measured against Bitcoin. If I want to sell my house, I'm not going to ask for fiat currency. I'm going to ask for Bitcoin. You can refinance the existing debt that sits on the property and you use that money for whatever you wish. Usually what people do, they um, buy more real estate, but I suggest buy some Bitcoin. Even if you buy it on leverage, you cannot outperform Bitcoin. Uh, I want to really dive deep today in the topic of real estate and Bitcoin. I think uh, you're the best person to speak to uh, when it comes to real estate and Bitcoin and also how real estate investors potentially can benefit from, from Bitcoin. Uh, but let's first dive into like, you came from real estate and now you're into Bitcoin. Like why did you uh, came into Bitcoin and why, what, what made Bitcoin so attractive for you as a real estate investor? Yeah, um, actually I, I came... I didn't really come into Bitcoin from real estate. I was a Bitcoiner that worked in the real estate industry and that helped me to get deeper into Bitcoin. So when I got into Bitcoin, I didn't work yet. I got into Bitcoin in university. And back then I had an academic, um, I'd say perspective. I was doing research on money and I was doing research on alternative monies. And at the time there wasn't only Bitcoin, there were... Um, there was no other cryptocurrency, but there were different concepts, concepts that still exist today. Um, basic universal income. Um, there was even at the time, I even met some people that were thinking of implanting microchips uh, in their hand to use that as sort of a credit card and a credit system. And Bitcoin was one of the options I looked into, but I intuitively liked it because it felt uh, it felt right. Uh, and then I wrote my master thesis about Bitcoin and I studied financial economics and then I went into the real estate industry. So um, I was stacking sets and working in the real estate industry parallel without combining the two or without thinking of combining the two. But then over time, by working in the real estate industry, I started to understand the real potential of Bitcoin because when I first got into Bitcoin, I was only interested in Bitcoin as a medium of exchange. Um, I wasn't really looking at Bitcoin the asset. I was looking at Bitcoin the network. And I thought Bitcoin is really interesting for uh, a variety of things, but also for the remittance market. And I always thought people, you take fiat currency, convert it into Bitcoin, send it somewhere to the other side of the world and convert it back into fiat currency, similar to what Strike is doing now. That was around like 2015, 2016. Um, that is because I had a Keynesian background and money for me, was a means of consumption. I didn't really understand money as a store of value. So the Austrian perspective is something I only learned through Bitcoin. And then while I worked in the real estate industry, I started to realize the total value of all real estate assets in the world is around $330 trillion. There are different estimates, but I'm going to stick with this number now because it's a number that's generally referenced in Bitcoin circles because Jesse Myers created this beautiful chart that you probably also are aware of. And then Bitcoin is a trillion dollar asset. Back then it was a billion dollar asset. And even as a half a trillion dollar asset or as a trillion dollar asset, looking at real estate, I think really helps um, to understand the potential of Bitcoin because real estate is the largest store of value in the world. And Bitcoin is a superior store of value because it's easier to maintain and it's mobile and highly liquid. You know, real estate isn't liquid and it's very expensive to maintain. And Bitcoin is cheap to maintain. There's almost no maintenance cost. You just have to take care of self-custody. And when I understood that, that Bitcoin 
is a superior store of value to real estate. And it's the fastest growing asset class in the world. I really started to understand that it most likely will have an impact on real estate because people buy real estate to hedge themselves against inflation. I mean, it's, that's something that we all are aware of. What do you do with your money? You invest your money in order to save it, in order to outperform inflation. And one of the most used assets to do that is real estate. People put in their money in real estate to protect it against monetary inflation. And they do it because real estate is scarce. And they also do it because they are good financing options for real estate, right? But Bitcoin is a superior option to secure a value over time and space. And I feel, therefore believe it's actually a competition to real estate. That might sound strange, strange to a real estate investor because there's a different utility in real estate, which you can use to live in, or you can use it to produce, or you can use it for as an event space and Bitcoin, which is a savings tool. But because real estate is used as a savings tool, Bitcoin has a near perfect savings tool and direct competition with Bitcoin. So that is why I started to combine the two fields of real estate and Bitcoin. That's an interesting discussion. I, I love Jesse Meyer's uh, chart. Also, I had him on on the podcast. It's really interesting also how he uh, goes about and, and f finds the Bitcoin in value. Um, when we compare now the huge real estate market, what would you say? I mean, it's I don't know if it's possible to, to, to answer this, but what would you say is there because it's used as a store of value and what is there because it's actually used as a house? It's actually used as what real estate actually is. So like what's the what's the monetary premium of, of this real estate market? Uh, so what's the potential for for Bitcoin to, to, to capture there? Yeah, it's a good question. I've been looking into it more recently and it's difficult to estimate, but I will give some ideas. So quickly uh, to explain what the monetary premium is, uh, real estate has a utility value, as I just mentioned, but people use it as a savings account, as money. Money used to be a store of value before it was uh, before the fiat system, basically. So the monetary premium in real estate really means it's used as money. So how much of the value of real estate is attributable to its use as money? and how much of it to its utility value. And um, I'll quickly uh, run through some numbers here for the Munich real estate market. I recently read a study that estimated that from 2008 until 2018, so 10 years, 2008 until 2018, real estate prices in Munich tripled. And that is because of the high rate of monetary inflation that central banks, central banks used after the financial crisis of 08 to basically um, help the economy uh, survive. And a lot of that money went into real estate. So house prices tripled, right? So that doesn't really give us a number, like the percentage number, how much of the value of a house is its use as money attributable to, how high is the monetary premium. But I'd say, you know, we could estimate anything between 40 to 70%, but it's really hard to do that. It's really hard to make an estimation. You would have to look into it. But you can make some estimations based on the following. So before the fiat standard, before 1971, when money was used as a store of value, the cost of construction were mainly made up of um, working force, uh, material, and land, right? But they were almost equally, equally distributable. So a third was um, craftsmanship or the work that went into the house. About a third was uh, material and a third the, the land. And at this point of time, the land is between 70 to 90 percent of the construction cost of a house. So labor and material make up much less of the total cost of constructing a house. And that kind of, you know, helps us to to understand how high the monetary premium is. But to put a number on it is, is very difficult because statistically it's difficult to estimate. But we can see that the la that land has become exponentially expensive, whereas labor and construction costs have also become more expensive, but um, not as expensive. Uh, it's an, really interesting for me because it sounds really weird when someone that is not into Bitcoin and you tell them, yeah, Bitcoin will make housing affordable. <laughs> uh, it, it sounds like a weird argument, but if you look at that and Bitcoin sucks up the re uh, pr monetary premium of, of real estate slowly and we get more efficient in producing houses and houses don't go up in value just because of store value, this could actually 
uh, make housing way more affordable uh, than it is now. Like, like it's now, but more it's like uh, it was like 100 years ago or 200 years ago, um, where it was not that big of a chunk. And with our technology advancement, that, that could be a, a huge steps for um, living for, for humans. That's a, I think that's an underrated um aspect of of bitcoin making other things cheaper or more affordable i, I like that aspect a lot of, of of that yeah i agree with you i totally agree with you because if you think about it uh, in uh, technology is uh, deflationary meaning things get cheaper over time because we get better at producing things uh, and the storage capacity of hardware for example also increases over time but the reason why things getting more expensive is because the monetary supply increases and with an increase in the monetary supply, individual units lose purchasing power. And then people have to invest to outperform inflation, which drives up the cost of housing, for example. And as you described, housing uh, will most likely become affordable uh, for those who hold Bitcoin or it already is for two reasons, right? If you hold Bitcoin, if you hold Bitcoin, housing is becoming more affordable because Bitcoin increases in purchasing power much faster than housing because it's scarcer. And as more people invest in Bitcoin, we can, we can, we can project into the future that there will be less demand for real estate to outperform inflation, which should also drive down the cost of housing. But I want to make a point here because it sounds strange sometimes when I talk to people that are not into Bitcoin and I tell them Bitcoin is going to make housing affordable. They just like shake their heads and they don't understand why. And I think it's important to understand that, in my opinion, and I think that's a perspective that the Austrians would take as well and Bitcoiners would take as well. Change starts with the individual, right? We cannot centrally, centrally plan change. Change starts with the individual. So in order for housing to become more affordable, the individual has to take action himself or herself and buy Bitcoin, right? To be able to afford more in the future because Bitcoin is disinflationary. There's less new supply over time and its purchasing power increases because demand for Bitcoin, quite frankly, increases because of its unique monetary properties and also because of fiat inflation. People always look to make a good investment. And Bitcoin, I think, is the best investment that you can make. Absolutely. Um, uh, just a, a small sidetrack here. You, you said you learned Keynesian economics. How did you break that that mindset that you learned uh, and actually awaken a little bit to, to the Austrian economics and to the Bitcoin mindset? Yeah, it's, it wasn't easy, to be honest with you. So I, I studied uh, philosophy and ethics and business management. So I did two bachelors. And I always had an interest in, in, in philosophy and art, but I also had an interest into economics. And I think that my interest in philosophy helped me to dish my Keynesian mindset because uh, in philosophy, at least how I approach philosophy, I always go by my intuition because um, sometimes uh, you can logically deduct an argument or you can just pay attention to what intuitively feels right to you. Right. And intuitively, when I got into Keynes and economics and I went into the bottom of it, it didn't feel right. It just didn't feel right. And uh, and then I learned about Bitcoin and it just intuitively felt right. But it took around, I'd say, five to six years to shed my Keynesian mindset and really open myself up to an Austrian perspective, to the Austrian school, the Austrian school of economics. Uh, I do not believe that the Austrian school has answers to all the que questions that exist, but at least it um, uh, has some guiding principles that are um, based um, in universal truths. And what I mean by truth is there is no universal truth. I mean, I don't really believe there's an objective truth. Things are subjective, values subjective, and opinions are. But at least there are some first principles that we can work on. And I'll give an example. So in, in 15, I think in 1570, Copernicus already proved the quantity theory of money. And what he basically proved is if you increase the monetary supply, you don't, do not increase wealth, you decrease the purchasing power of outstanding units. So it actually has a counter effect of whoever intended to increase the wealth by increasing the monetary supply. And that's something that was uh, discovered 500 years ago. And that's something that the Austrians started to build on again. 
And uh, that's something that I like because I believe that we do not have to be progressive. We do not have to consistently find a new system. We just have to understand how things worked in the past and then learn from the past um, rather than trying to invent a new future. So if you really think about it, what Bitcoin does, it takes us back to how things were thousands, hundreds, or maybe tens of thousands of years ago. And um, the Keynesian school is fairly new. I mean, Bitcoin follows uh, universal principles, hermetic principles that have been known to humanity for thousands of years. And the Keynesian school of thought is fairly new. It exists for less than 100 years. John Mayard Keynes was a British economist who rose to fame in the 1930s and um, is the founding father, at least mentally, of the existing fiat system. And uh, it took me some time to open myself up to uh, the possibility of finding a different uh, economic principle. But uh, yeah. It's interesting how uh, this thought is not that long here, but it's so dominant. If you look in all the universities, when you look in uh, what professors usually teach about what uh, also, of course, from central banks and everything, uh, it trickles down. Why, why do you think, uh, why do you think was Keynesian economics so uh, successful in the last hundred years in, uh, not successful in, in monetary terms, but it's successful in, in marketing, I guess. So in, in, in making its uh, dominant way to universities, to curriculums, to, to the schools. It's, it's difficult to answer, but I, I think it has to do with war, and I, t and I explain what I mean by that. So in 1971, on the 15th of August, 1971, the U.S. president at the time, Richard Nixon, announced that the U.S. would stop the convertibility of the dollar into gold at a fixed rate. Um, and since 1944, the U.S. and its allies established the Bretton Woods Agreement at the end of the Second World War, and it um, linked the currencies of the allied nations to the dollar and it linked the dollar to gold. So it was a quasi gold standard. It wasn't a pure gold standard, but it was a quasi gold standard. And then in 1971, why did the US go off the quasi gold standard? They did so in order to compete with the Soviet Union because the Soviet Union, due to their monetary system, was able to fund war like perpetually. And the US was limited in funding war due to the fiat system, which limited the printing press. But when Richard Nixon announced that they would end the convertibility of the dollar into gold at a fixed rate, it also allowed them to compete with the Soviet Union by funding war more extremely in Vietnam and in Afghanistan and other countries of the world. So I think the competition between nation states, nation states, excuse me, that always ends up in war favors the fiat system because the fiat system allows you to print money and war is very costly. So there's a link here. I don't know if that explained your question, but I believe that is the reason um, because it basically helps nation states to perpetually fund war and compete with each other with a fake advantage, basically. I, hopefully that, that will uh, change once the concept. You, you probably have written, the, uh, not written, uh, uh, read the, the Sovereign Individual. Uh, and I'm a big fan of being more free of where you have been born uh, and that uh, it's it's more easily you can you can choose what what you want to be governed with like you can choose uh, your services and and your things that you actually want to uh, uh, take advantage of when you look in a, into a state. So what I mean by that is uh, you as an individual are now born in like Austria uh, and you have advantages and disadvantages by that. But what if you can just like choose, uh, oh no, I don't want to be governed by the Austrian state, but I want to be governed by something else. That could be an uh, interesting uh, model to make this, this war models, those Keynesian economic models um, a little less relevant. And I think Bitcoin might be the first step towards that future. Um, but it's, uh, it, it will be a long time. I mean, the internet and remote work and all those things are uh, another steps <laughs> to, towards that future. Uh, and I hope that, uh, that, that we come to that, uh, future, uh, where this makes more sense. Are you, um, it's a, a sidetrack here, but, uh, are you, in um, not, not really, but happy to learn. 
Oh yeah, like uh, it's it's just a plan B, like the get, getting a second passport or something like that. I, I'm just like uh, researching a little bit in that. But let's come back to the real estate. Uh, sorry for my small sidetrack here. Um, we you you mentioned before that we that real estate really um, lost value when you compare it to Bitcoin. So like Bitcoin already made um, housing way more affordable. I saw the numbers before the podcast. Uh, again, it was like 32 Bitcoin in the US the average home. Uh, five years ago, now it's around like five, six, depending on what numbers you're looking at. Yeah. Uh, how, how do you think uh, this will compare in, in the future? Because I'm not a huge fan of, of Bitcoin price predictions in US dollars, because mm -hmm. it's like US dollars is like they can print and this can <laughs> really mess up your models. But housing is way more fixed. You can way more predictable uh say like oh there will be so many houses in the world so there will be so many bitcoins in the world and adoption rate and stuff like that how do you look like like uh, uh, uh house prices in the future measured in bitcoin uh five ten twenty years ago do you have some framework around that or is it something that you're not interested in no i am interested in that and i have a framework that i work with and i basically like what you said because it's easy to give price predictions for bitcoin going forward and I do that sometimes just to help people understand the um, potential of Bitcoin within their mindset because they still use the dollar or the euro as a unit of account. But I think what's important to understand is that if we look at money, money has different functions. So first of all, money needs to be a medium of exchange. It needs to be something that we can use to buy goods and services. And then the question is, what is a good medium of exchange? A good medium of exchange is a type of money that retains its value over time because otherwise nobody would accept that money for payment. If they are forced legally, of course they will, but generally speaking, they won't. So money needs to be a good store of value. And then thirdly, money is a unit of account. We can use money to measure things. And if we use the dollar to measure a home, it looks like the home is rising, but it's actually only rising in nominal value, almost on par with monetary inflation. So as money enters the economy, people invest in real estate and some of the money that enters the economy actually enters the real estate market through mortgages, right? But you have to change your mindset, basically. You have to change your unit of account. The new unit of account that I personally use is Bitcoin or Satoshis and it's repricing every asset in the world. And if you price real estate in Bitcoin, you can see how drastically real estate is falling in price when measured against Bitcoin. And at some point in the future, let's say, you know, uh, we put out a hypothetical scenario in which hyperinflation, meaning there will be inflation rates higher than 150% a month, uh, where fiat currencies will have lost their purchasing power. And then Bitcoin will not be priced in fiat currencies, but Bitcoin will be priced in whatever you can buy with Bitcoin. So goods and services. So at some point in the future, you will not say, oh, my house is worth $1 million and $1 million are X Bitcoin. You will just say, my house is worth one Bitcoin or my house is worth 0 0.1 Bitcoin. And now to give an estimation, how much should a house be worth? Difficult to say, even uh, on a Bitcoin standard. So a standard where we have a fixed monetary supply and people do not need to invest into scarce assets like real estate to, to outperform inflation there's a high utility value in real estate, right? So real estate and prime locations will still be very expensive. And to give you a number is difficult, but we could say, you know, right now you set a house costs around five Bitcoin, I think an average home, maybe in the future an average home will be less than 0 0.1 Bitcoin. Maybe it will be 0 0.05 Bitcoin. Um, you can basically, you can take all the assets in the world and divide it by 21 million to basically get an idea of uh, the potential price for certain goods and services. That's a mental exercise that people can maybe do at home. Look at all the value in the world, look at gold, art, stocks, equities, bonds, and real estate. Um, that's around 900 trillion. Divide that by 21 million, see what that is for one Bitcoin. And then uh, look what a house is worth right now. So I, I'm assuming it's uh, on the top of my head. It should be uh, one Bitcoin is over 20 million in that case, right? So um, if if a house is worth 1 million now, let's just say, 
you said 500,000, but I'm just going to say 1 million for, for the purpose of making it easier to calculate, I could buy 20 houses with one Bitcoin. So you see, I mean, the purchasing power of Bitcoin uh, in the future of one Bitcoin of 100 million Satoshis, it's going to be way higher uh, than today. I have one interesting model. I, I use Jesse Myers model. Uh, and he, I think in his estimation, he used very conservatively uh, that Bitcoin will consume 20% of the uh, yeah. of the world's assets, which I think is the kind of the, the conservative, really conservative case. Um, and then I thought like, okay, what's the most bullish? Like if Bitcoin is, is, is the most successful in the world, what's the most bullish case for Bitcoin? Uh, and I was going to uh, 85% because I think there will always be value in other things, uh, in some things more and some things less. Uh, but if, if Bitcoin is the best store of value, most people will hold almost all the wealth in Bitcoin and will not deal with the headaches of real estate, will not deal with the headaches of owning an individual company and stuff like that. So I think like 85, maybe it's 80, maybe it's 90, maybe it's 70 is a good estimation. And then you take Jesse Meyer's um, model uh, and then uh, do it with 85, uh, 58% of uh no, 85% of, of the whole total net assets. And this divided then not by 21 million. I used 15 million Bitcoin because I think there are a lot of Bitcoin lost and there might be more Bitcoin lost in the future. This brings you actually down to exactly um, uh, a $50 million price uh, per Bitcoin, uh, which is insane, uh, especially when you think of it's today's tallest terms. Like it's not... Uh, <laughs> there's inflation coming on top like that's because most people say like yeah but at that point 50 million will not be any, worth anything yeah but 50 million in 10 years might be 500 million yeah. uh, in, in 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 that term so uh that's for me the most bullish case and, and that's what i usually try uh when when i think of like okay what's the most bullish case <laughs> should i really focus on bitcoin yes i should focus on bitcoin because if it's successful it's it's super 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 successful uh, and in that case, like you, you can, you can buy a lot of, <laughs> you can buy a lot of houses with one Bitcoin, uh, even like good houses, like a $1 million uh, is, is not a bad house. It's not a massively good house in a massively good area, but it's already a good house. So, uh, I, I like the way you think. And I think we, we, we kind of like have the, the same directions. What, what do you think of the eight, 85%? Is that something that it seems realistic or would you say, uh, other, other estimations? Yeah, no, I mean, your calculation is correct. I was just making estimations, but um, you were, your calculation is obviously more precise and is actually correct because Jesse also makes the case, I, th I think he says there's 900 trillion assets. If the 200 uh, trillion of that will be put into Bitcoin, then he says 21 million Bitcoin is the number we should divide it by. But you are actually correct. Many of the Bitcoins have been lost, so it's actually less. But he divides it by, I think, 21 million and he says $10 million per Bitcoin. And you actually say, let's take 85% of that. Um, so a $50 million um, Bitcoin price target is um, is realistic when you think what could buy you 50 million today. So instead of thinking one Bitcoin equals 50 million, that's completely crazy. You should think what goods and services can be bought today with $50 million and then take that basket of goods and services and say, I can buy these goods and services with one Bitcoin in the future. So you take away the nominal value because fiat currency is consistently being inflated. So when we say one Bitcoin will be worth 50 million, that sounds completely crazy. But obviously at that point of time, 50 million will be not what 50 million are today. And I like the idea of looking at what goods and services can be bought in the future with Bitcoin rather than saying, or what amount of goods and services can be bought with Bitcoin in the future, rather than saying one Bitcoin will be worth X amount of fiat currency, because fiat currency in the future will have little meaning because things will be repriced in Bitcoin, right? So in the future, if I want to sell my house, I'm not going to ask for fiat currency, I'm going to ask for Bitcoin. But when I say in the future, I'm really making a hypothetical example here of decades into the future, because I think for the coming upcoming decades, let's say the upcoming 20 or 30 years, 
the fiat system will prevail, I think. Um, the money printer can go on for longer than we hope. So um, there will be a parallel system, a Bitcoin economy and a fiat economy alongside each other for the foreseeable future. And the Bitcoin economy is going to grow very, very fast um, in purchasing power, whereas the fiat uh, economy will lose purchasing power rapidly and also exponentially. So if you work in real estate, and maybe that's something you also wanted to discuss today, um, just be aware that the speculation that is happening in real estate will most likely move over to Bitcoin and real estate will collapse to its utility value. But this does not mean that people do not need a space to live or work in. So real estate as a business and real estate as a service will remain important, right? You offer a service to the market, housing, an event space, a production facility, and you receive rent in return. And I think that's important to understand that once the speculation that is happening in real estate has moved over to Bitcoin and real estate will be priced based on its utility value, it's important to think about, okay, what happens then? How do I deal with it? How do I deal with the transition phase? If I run a real estate business, you know, how do I manage my debt structure? How do I manage my maintenance reserves? How do I utilize Bitcoin? You could also, I was just today, I was talking with uh, Lucas of uh, 21 Energy and uh, I've been going on this rabbit hole of combining uh, Bitcoin mining with real estate. Because if you think about it, it's very energy intense to maintain uh, real estate and energy costs at the moment uh, are quite high as well. And uh, computing generates heat, right? So it has a byproduct of mining, which is heat, and that can be used. Uh, that can be used with uh, in physical structures, that can be used to heat a room, it can be used to heat water, it can be used in industrial plants, and it can also be combined with solar. So in Germany, there's no regulation that you need to have solar on your roof if you have if you build a new apartment block. But the problem with that is uh, in the city of Hamburg, for example, we have around 15% sunlight throughout the year. So that makes it very difficult to um, run a solar uh, construction on your roof profitable. And also, once you have excess solar, it's sometimes difficult to sell it to the grid because sometimes the grid has overcapacity and you can't sell your energy to the grid. And Bitcoin mining can serve as an economic battery here where you, at the point where you cannot sell the energy to the grid, you mine Bitcoin, which also helps you to um, be profitably quicker. It can take up to seven years until uh, solar or wind construction is profitable. But if you combine it with Bitcoin mining, it can be profitable after two or three years. So that's pretty interesting. So I think the the, the merge of Bitcoin mining into physical infrastructures is something that we will see going forward. And uh, I can also imagine that a lot of the hash rate, a lot of the um, energy, a lot of the electricity that get, gets feed into the Bitcoin network in the future will not be provided by companies that focus on Bitcoin mining, but it will be provided by energy companies that use Bitcoin mining as an economic battery to feed in surplus energy that is not needed at the point of its production. That is true for solar and wind, but it's also true for oil. Because if you drill oil, what happens is that gas, methane gas, is being uh, released and people just burn it. They just flare it. But uh, you can obviously use Bitcoin mining to utilize that energy. And that's already being done in, uh, in Texas and other uh, states in the U.S. predominantly. But I can imagine that being done uh, all over the world. And now as a real estate developer, we are looking into how can we combine Bitcoin mining um, into um, real estate development and how can we use Bitcoin mining to provide heat into uh, the physical infrastructure that is uh, the property that we manage. If you watch my podcast already for more than two times, you know how extremely passionate I am about self-custody. And the first very, very, very important step to self-custody is always getting yourself a hardware wallet. And I have one for you here. This is the Bitcoin only edition from the Bitbox, my favorite single signature hardware wallet on the market. Another really important 
important piece of self-custody if you have a hardware wallet is the backup of the seed phrase. And Bitbox made the perfect solution to back up your seed phrase. They made a reusable steel wallet. Check out that beauty. It's durable and extremely heavy. If I put it on the desk, I seriously feel for my own table. It's so, so heavy and durable. I love it. This is where my seed phrase is secure. Go to bitbox.swiss robin to get your bitbox. And if you use code robin, you even get 5% off of your complete order. And the next step is to really level up your sovereignty as an individual. You have to have the most secure self-custody setup. You have to secure your own devices. You have to protect your privacy. You have to set up an inheritance plan. And depending on where you live, you even want to have a plan B, a citizenship where you can move in case something goes really, really wrong. And through all those steps, the Bitcoin way is is guiding you through step by step. And if you visit the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash Robin, you even get a 30 minute free call to find out how you can level up your sovereignty. And last but not least, I have something completely new for you guys. I partnered up with Coin Vigilante. This is the most beautiful Bitcoin timepiece that I ever saw created by anyone. Look at that beauty. I love it so much. Coin Vigilante made an perfect Bitcoin watch. That's the perfect, subtle, elegant way to go out there and show that you are a Bitcoiner. And that watch brand is Bitcoin only. And Coin Vigilante just dropped a completely new and amazing Genesis edition of their watch collections. You have the date of the first ever mined Bitcoin block in there. And of course, also the block height and which epoch we are currently in. I love the level of detail they put in in this masterpiece. And make sure to check out those amazing Coin Vigilante timepieces down in the descriptions. I love those watches so, so much. Ah, that's, that's really interesting. Um, using Bitcoin as a as a feature for for real estate, basically, you you mentioned one thing now with with uh, Bitcoin mining in uh, real estate facilities, which is an amazing thing. I also see people actually using the heat of Bitcoin miners to warm up their pools or whatever, which is yeah. an interesting uh, thing, or just warm up the the water in general. Um, how else can real estate investors or real estate uh, developers uh, consider Bitcoin and integrate Bitcoin in their strategies? Yeah. Um, so I'll start with um, something very simple. Something very simple is that you can use a service like Relay to build maintenance reserves in Bitcoin. So you can look at your cash flow, the monthly income that you make from uh, rents that you receive, and you can allocate a percentage of that um, towards buying Bitcoin. You can say, I take, I'd say, like, I don't know, I'll throw out a number here, 10% or 15%. 20% is also fine, but you don't want to drain your cash flow if you are still repaying debt that you took on to construct the property. But you can take up to 20% of your rental income and just buy Bitcoin with it. And it's important to hold it for a minimum of four years. That is a halving cycle in Bitcoin. So Bitcoin goes through these cycles of bull and bear markets. And usually after the Bitcoin halving, which is an event, that cuts the block reward that is being distributed to whoever successfully adds a block to the Bitcoin chime chain. And uh, that also includes transaction fees. And that is being halved every four years to decrease the supply until 2140 when the last uh, Satoshi uh, will be mined. And after that, after the halving event, usually Bitcoin goes through a bull market because with less uh, supply, and demand that is consistent or potentially increasing due to more fiat currency being available or the need to protect savings, Bitcoin increases in price. So you need to have at least a four-year minimum holding period, ideally longer, ideally much longer. So ideally 10, 20 or 30 years as a holding period. And then um, something I would also suggest is what real estate developers usually do as the gap between the debt that is on the property and its value increases, right? Say, let's say a real estate house uh, or real estate project, a property is worth a million dollars. I don't know, and you took out a loan for 
I'd say, 800,000, right? To construct it, you had 200,000 uh, of your own money, equity. Then it's finished, it's worth a million dollars. And then after five years, it's worth $1.2 million. And you already paid some of the debt back. You can refinance the existing debt that sits on the property and you use that money for whatever you wish. Usually what people do, they um, buy more real estate, but I suggest buy some Bitcoin. So refinance the existing portfolios that you hold to buy Bitcoin and you basically copy Michael Saylor by doing this, right? What is Michael Saylor doing? He has a company that has income. He takes debt against the future income of that company and he buys Bitcoin with it, right? And as a real estate uh, owner, as a real estate uh, developer that manages its own properties, you can do that as well. And something I'd like to suggest, that's something I've been talking about quite a lot uh, recently, is um, I believe that if you construct real estate, right, I would suggest to take out a loan that includes Bitcoin. So instead of taking on a, a loan of $1 million, take out a loan of $1 million, uh, 100000 You take the $1 million and you direct it to constructing the property as you usually would. You take 100000 extra and you buy Bitcoin with it and you hold it in the same entity that holds the real estate project. By doing that, you hedge yourself against the scenario where the monetary premium that sits in real estate flows into Bitcoin, right? And you also profit from Bitcoin's exponential increase in purchasing power. And you can use Bitcoin in your company structure as a capital base that's growing in purchasing, sorry, in purchasing power to lend against to then maintain your property, right? So the integration of Bitcoin into real estate has different stages, maintenance reserves, refinancing and including it in financing, generally speaking. And I believe it's going to revolutionize the real estate sector, very similar to how e-commerce revolutionized retail. So, you know, in, in the late 90s, if you would have told somebody that owns a successful retail store on a high street anywhere in the world to open up a website, they probably would have thought that you are talking gibberish, right? They would not have been able, most likely, to see the need of doing that. And I think it is important if you are in real estate to adopt Bitcoin strategies because Bitcoin is digital capital. It's a digital store of value and is it's going to disrupt the real estate industry similar to how the retail industry disrupted, uh, sorry, similar to how e-commerce disrupted the real, uh, retail industry. Ah, that's really interesting. Do you think that Bitcoin will also be used in the same way as real estate with, with collateral, that be, people just use their own uh, Bitcoin to, to use it as a collateral and then refinance things and stuff like that? Is, is that a future you see? Yeah, I do, I do, I do, I do think so, but I want to make a disclaimer here. So um, I'm going to give an extended answer. And um, uh, I like that question that you just asked because um, real estate is not just the number one store of value in the world. It is also the number one type of collateral that is accepted by, by banks or financial institutions to give out a loan. And Bitcoin actually is pristine collateral for lending because it increases in purchasing power over time. And if you lend against any type of collateral, you want to own a collateral that increases in purchasing power over time. So the LTV ratio, loan to value ratio, decreases over time. But I have to make a disclaimer, and that's the following. If you give a bank your Bitcoin to get fiat credit, right? You are, that's, that's high risk. Why is it a high risk? Because you potentially could lose out on the Bitcoin. If you lose Bitcoin, you lose out on the future increase in purchasing power of that Bitcoin. So there's a high risk involved. So I believe you should only take out a loan against your Bitcoin if you have a multi-sig setup where you still possess the Bitcoin that you lend against. Because otherwise, the risk of losing your Bitcoin do not really justify getting fiat currency in return. And um, yeah, so therefore, the ability to secure Bitcoin in a multi-sig setup with a lender is very, very important. And I also want to um, say something about the potential benefits of Bitcoin, not just for the borrower, because for the borrower, it's very clear. As long as Bitcoin increases in purchasing power faster than fiat interest rates, it makes sense to borrow against your Bitcoin and spend that fiat currency because the increase in purchasing power will outrun 
the interest rate, right? But only do that if you can secure Bitcoin in a multi-signature setup. And for the lender, I think, if you give out a credit line, you can basically hedge yourself against the default of that credit line by forcing or requiring the borrower to buy Bitcoin as well. Because let's say, Robin, you want to start a business and I give you a credit line, but I ask you to buy Bitcoin as well. And will you and me be hold it together in a multi-custodial um, setup? If you go bankrupt, if your business goes bankrupt and you default on the loan, I still have the Bitcoin that I gave you. So that basically is a hedge against borrower default. And that's why I believe that Bitcoin will become an integrate or will be integrated into credit markets, generally speaking, because there are many benefits for the borrower, yes, but there are also many benefits for the lender. And I think that's particularly interesting. So if I would be a bank, I would include Bitcoin into all credit uh, products that I give out. That, that would be a huge step for when, when banks all of a sudden say to every customer, yeah, but you have to buy Bitcoin also. <laughs> that, that, that would be, I think that would uh, trigger some, some, some nice news. But uh, it, it makes sense. Like from a first principle standpoint, if you are a bank and you want to lend out money or you want to borrow money, whatever your situation is, it makes for both actually sense to have some Bitcoin uh, as a reserve for, for defaulting. I, I, I like the idea. I never heard that idea actually before from anyone. Like, and that's, that's really interesting as I, you might 260th uh, Bitcoin podcast. So it takes a little bit to, to tell me something completely new, but I, I like that idea a lot. Like that's, that's an, a cool idea. One thing I also wanted to bring up uh, from our discussion before I forgot to mention it. Um, I like the idea of pricing Bitcoin in gold. Uh, and, and when you look now at the gold price, it's around like 76 or 78,000 uh, uh, US dollars. And Bitcoin is at uh, around uh, about 65,000 uh, US dollars, a uh, gold price for one kilogram, I, I should say. Uh, so it's, it's right around the, the same number. So uh, it, I, I like to like the idea also of, of pricing uh, Bitcoin in like how many Bitcoin do you need for, for buying one kilogram of gold? Uh, I think that that should, that should have been the, 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 the number we actually should, should focus on. But I just wanted to, to, um, note that from, from from earlier, I think that's a that's an interesting way to to think about and, and pricing Bitcoin. Really cool what you also think about um, uh, real estate. One question I always have when when I talk with real estate people: um, once you really get Bitcoin, why would you do anything with real estate to begin with? Like, why, why would you put any money uh, in 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 the real estate developments? Why not just shift everything? Uh, you have into Bitcoin. I mean, I have had some real estate investors, especially uh, on the show that uh, actually went completely into Bitcoin. And they also explained like uh, how long it took to, to, to sell all those houses and stuff like that. Is there an argument to be made uh, if you're a real estate investor, uh, not a developer, then it's like a business, it's not really an investment then uh, to, to still invest in, in real estate or is there, uh, how, how do you see that topic? No. In my opinion, there is not, there's no point to invest in real estate. I mean, uh, it's just, I don't want to insult anyone. So I was just about to say it's a foolish idea if you can think you can outperform Bitcoin. And I'd like to propose a mental exercise. There's a, uh, there's a cool website. I think it's called bitcoincompounding.com. And there's a guy, he, uh, he made a, basically a model, um, the Bitcoin Fire Calculator. So if you Google the Bitcoin Fire Calculator, uh, it just it should come up. The website should come up, and it basically there are six different models with different caggers with different compound annual growth rates. Exactly. So um, if we look at the compound annual growth rates here, and we take model three, so model three is fairly conservative, and it uh, projects that the compound annual growth rate of Bitcoin going forward will be around thirty five percent. So in the past four years, it was around fifty five percent, something like that. There are different estimates depending when do you start uh, and what year and what month and so forth. But I do like Model 3 because it's fairly conservative. And if you believe you can outperform these year-on-year -year growth rates over the long term with any asset, it's just foolish because mathematically speaking, you just can't. You just can't. Even if real estate is bought on leverage, because real estate becomes interesting if you buy it on leverage. Without leverage, real estate is not interesting. If you buy it on leverage, it becomes interesting because 
um, you borrow the money, right? And you buy an asset that you were not able to buy beforehand. But even if you buy it on leverage, you cannot outperform Bitcoin. So to invest in real estate to outperform Bitcoin is quite frankly a bit of a foolish idea. But real estate development, and you made that distinction as well. You made the distinction between real estate investing and real estate development. And I'd like to make that distinction as well because I would consider myself a real estate developer. I don't invest in real estate. I invest all my savings and all my personal money into Bitcoin. But I work in a real estate company and uh, I help to build that company as an employee. And that company has existed since 2015. And that company has projects that have to be run for the next 10 years. And that has to be repaid. So I cannot just stop and say, guys, I'm out, right? So I understand there's a paradigm shift going on. But I also understand that I have, um, um, yeah, maybe it's, 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 it's up to me and it's my job to help the people around me understand what is happening and help them utilize Bitcoin. Because the people that I work with, they would also consider themselves real estate developers because I have some internal discussions within the company. And everybody that works within the company works there because they like the building environment. They don't invest into real estate because they are real estate investors. They invest into real estate because they like the building environment. They either are architects or they're just, they just generally like um, to be real estate entrepreneurs, right? They like the real estate business. And I think going forward, we'd have to think of real estate more of a business where the way we think about real estate now is quite frankly, we think of it as a financial asset because it has been priced away from its utility value because it is used as a store of value to outperform inflation. But um, um, the financial aspect of real estate will most likely fade away over time and real estate will go back to being a business. And the real estate business is an interesting business, right? I mean, you get rent, the cash flow is always nice. And if you combine it with Bitcoin, it can be an interesting business. But I do believe the focus at this point in time for any investor in the world should be Bitcoin. I like that fire calculator a lot. I never saw it. Uh, I will. I will play with that a lot. <laughs> it's pretty good. It's not if, yeah. It's pretty good if you have a hard time and you think, oh, things don't work out. You can put in your stack there and project it into the future, and you're like, oh, things are good. <laughs> uh, maybe I'll make a video around that. I think it's uh, uh, people are really interested in like when to retire on on your Bitcoin stack and stuff like that. I think it, it actually makes nice calculation. You can put in like your. Uh, uh, and, and targeted stack when you uh, want to retire, basically, when you want to, do you want to withdraw? Do you want to have um, a fixed dollar amount to, to withdraw from it? Like it's, it's an interesting um, website. I learned a lot of new things today. Really, really cool. Um, is there anything else uh, that I forgot about uh, real estate to ask? Is there anything else that you really want to to mention here in, in the real estate uh, discussion with Bitcoin? No, I, there, there's nothing to add. Uh, if I do have something to add, I'll comment uh, on, uh, under our podcast. If there's anything that comes to my mind at this point, uh, there's nothing. But I enjoyed the conversation. Really, really cool. Thank you. I, I, I sometimes, especially with with, with uh, topics that I'm not so familiar with as as real estate, I'm I, I don't know a lot of about real estate. I, I always want to make sure uh, I, I covered everything. So that's uh, why I asked that question. Um, now we come to the end of the podcast, where I have uh, one question is always the same uh, question for every guest, and one question that is um coming from the the previous guest the one question is always the same question for every guest is what can we learn from you uh besides bitcoin and real estate what, the, um, I, I don't really know um i'm still learning myself i mean i i decided to be a student not a teacher so um i'm not sure what you can learn of me but i'm trying like i have a newsletter that i that just like to share if you go on leon vancom.substack.com. I have a newsletter where I share uh, my thought process. I write about Bitcoin and real estate, but not only. I started writing about Bitcoin and philosophy years ago before I got into Bitcoin and real estate. Um, so I'm not only interested in Bitcoin or real estate, I'm really interested in philosophy and ethics as well. Um, I also I write about spirituality, spiritual practice, uh, meditation, and some of my routines that I use um, to be focused on um, you know being an investor in the Bitcoin space, but at the same time also have enough time that I can allocate to, let's say, my spiritual practice. Um, so if you're interested um, in, in my thoughts, you can follow my Substack. Yeah.
Is, is the, um, has Bitcoin an impact on philosophy uh, in, in the general society? Do you think the ethics and, and philosophy might actually be uh, influenced by sound money? I think will be re revolutionized maybe because right now you can just say things. You can say, you know, postmodernism, post-constructualism. You can just say everything that we knew so far doesn't count. Everything's different and you can construct these dystopian or utopian realities and quite frankly the last let's say 60 70 years um you had that uh, as a trend and i think it's it's connected to the fiat world because the fiat system does not work but people don't see it because money the money supply is consistently being increased for so the system can perpetually exist but the system by itself is actually sick it's like a sick heroin patient that you give uh, methadone, I think methadone is like uh, what you give heroin patients instead of heroin, but it doesn't mean that these people are not sick anymore. And just because there's more money funneled into the system does not mean that the system works well. But people think the system works well, and based on that, they then assume what will happen in the future. So a lot of the philosophical thoughts and a lot of the ethical thoughts that are very relevant or pre-relevant today actually don't make sense. And I think Bitcoin exposes that. Bitcoin, exp if you, you cannot bullshit in Bitcoin because if you lose your Bitcoin, Bitcoin are gone. The Bitcoin are gone. You need to be self-responsible. And I think self-responsibility in the individual should lie at the center of any society. And that's, that was the case in the past and it's not the case anymore. We have all these collective ideas, whatever you want to call it. I don't even want to give them names because I don't want to bash anyone, but uh, the individual, I think is in the center of, um, of, of, of existence. And Bitcoin can help to take bullshit as basically the platform. Because right now in politics and in philosophy and, and mainstream media, you have people that are bullshitting, right? But they are bullshitting because they're in a system where bullshitters are not penalized for, um, for their behavior. And that's, and I believe that Bitcoin can bring uh, our, or can give our ideas a more realistic base, a more realistic footing. Really, really cool. I, I love it a lot. And we have the end routine also where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest. Uh, and this, <laughs> I think it's, it's very suiting. It's, it's a, almost a philosophical question. Um, what have you done today, which will make you a better human tomorrow? Mm, actually, I took some time this morning. I had a very busy week. And I was just going through appointments, pop, 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 pop. And this morning I took like two, two hours off. I didn't pay attention to my phone. I just went inside. And uh, I think it's important to go inside because with everything that's happening in the world, people tend to go outside and they tend to blame other people for whatever is happening. And I do that sometimes as well. I become resentful and politicized. Whenever I take the time to go inside, I start to forgive. And I start to focus on myself rather than making other people responsible for failures that I am responsible for. I, I start to take self-responsibility. And I think it's important to take self-responsibility for mistakes that we made. And I think that's something that I tried at least this morning. Really cool. Thank you for sharing this with us. Uh, also, thank you so much for, for taking your time. Um, you already mentioned your newsletter. Is there any uh, other way people can reach out to you and find you? On Nostra, I really like Nostra. Uh, I could talk a lot about Nostra as well. And I think the importance of having a, a protocol for decentralized information exchange that cannot be censored or stopped. So you can find me on Nostra uh, at Leon Vancom. That's the same um, tag you can find me on X. But um, Nostra just feels a bit more uh, personal. But the notes that I share on Nostra are a bit more personal, whereas X is more business focused. Oh, interesting. Uh... I'm also since I think two weeks on Nostra actively <laughs> uh, and uh, and I like it a lot. It, it, it has some good future. I mean, it's it's still in the very early days. It feels like, uh, I think Jack Dorsey even uh, uh, posted it. I think it feels like Twitter in the very, very early days uh, and it's an interesting uh, thing to have. Yeah. Thank you so much for, for being on, Leon. Also, thank you so much for everyone that is watching and listening uh, for joining us today. As always, I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye.